For chapter 9, we're starting to look at what is the molecular shape of molecules, how do we determine that molecular shape, and we're going to get into Vesper theory, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, to help us better understand the shape of molecules. First few announcements, chapter 7 and chapter 8 homework are due on Sunday, um, right? We're in the last few days of this summer session, this this packed full summer session, the practice exam, the study guide, I made those yesterday and they're posted. Um, the outline for next week, Monday, we're going to finish chapter 9 live. Uh, Tuesday, I'm going to cover chapter 10 as a play posit module. Wednesday will be a live review session, so during the normal class time, I will go over the practice exam, any last minute questions everyone has, and then the final exam, Thursday, June 25th. Uh, and the final assignment, the chemistry in your life assignment, that is also due as a PowerPoint file uh, to be emailed to me uh, by that Friday night, June 26th. Uh, chapter 9 and 10 homework will also be due next week as well. So up to this point, we've looked at how to determine if, if two elements, when they react, am I going to form an ionic bond or a covalent bond? Well, now we need to figure out what's the shape of those molecules when those elements come together to form a, a covalent bond, for example, in the example shown here. Right, we've got carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and we've got really large structures, something like hemoglobin, right, where we've got a very large, complicated three-dimensional shape to even small structures like vitamin C, where there's distinct three-dimensional shape to that molecule that's important for the activity of the molecule, the reactivity, the properties, the solubility of that molecule. So we need to understand where do these shapes come from. And essentially, that is our molecular geometry. That's what we're going to look at. What is basically the three-dimensional representation of the molecule? Right, the molecular geometry is the three-dimensional shape of a molecule. And we're going to have to determine this based on, you know, what our bonding and non-bonding electrons. We're going to take a look at how many bonds are around the central atom in question and how many extra electrons, how many lone pair electrons are also around that central atom. This is important because for example, looking at these two examples, carbon dioxide, CO2 here, and sulfur dioxide here, we might look at those two, CO2 and SO2, and think they must have the same molecular shape because they both have one central atom and two flanking oxygens. That's not true. Linear, right? Carbon dioxide is linear, whereas sulfur dioxide is bent. And so as a result, they have different properties. So. The shape of a molecule plays an important role in determining reactivity, physical properties like boiling point, for example, and the shape, we're going to determine the shape by noting basically how many bonds are around a central atom? How many bonding and non-bonding electron pairs? So we need to look at, first, the Lewis structure for all of these to figure out how many electrons I have, and then how many of those electrons are bonding, how many of those electrons are not bonding. So here's an example. I've got boron trifluoride and I've got phosphorus trifluoride. Both 
have one central atom and three fluorides attached to that central atom. However, both have different geometries. Boron trifluoride is flat, whereas the phosphorus trifluoride is more of a pyramid shape. So why do those two have a different geometry? Where does that geometry come from? So to answer that question, we have to draw the Lewis structure for both of those atoms. So I can do the Lewis structure for boron trifluoride. The first step would be, well, boron has three valence electrons, right? Boron is going to be helium. 2s2, 2p1. Fluorine has seven valence electrons. Fluorine is also going to be helium, 2s2, 2p5. Phosphorus and fluorine. So phosphorus is neon, 3s2, 3p3. Phosphorus is going to have five valence electrons, and my, heat, my fluorine still has seven valence electrons. 2s2, 2p5. So how do I put those together? Well, I'm going to put the boron in the middle. I'm going to put the phosphorus in the middle. For my total electrons, boron brings three, and then I have three fluorines at seven each. So I've got 21 plus three. I've got 24 electrons to assign. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six to connect the fluorines. So I have 18 left. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. I've assigned all of the lone pair electrons for boron trifluoride. Now taking a look at the phosphorus trifluoride. Phosphorus has five electrons, and then I have three fluorines at seven each, so that's 21 plus 5, 26 electrons I have to assign. Well, I'm going to assign the electrons to fluorine, the covalently bonded electrons. So there's six electrons assigned. Now I have 20 more to assign. One, two, three, four, five, and six. One, two, three, four, five, and six. One, two, three, four, five, and six. So that's 18 total electrons I've assigned. I have two electrons remaining. I have a full octet on all of the fluorines, so I cannot place those electrons there. If I look at the central phosphorus, however, I only have six electrons assigned in those three covalent bonds. So the remaining electrons are assigned to phosphorus, and that's why phosphorus trifluoride is a different geometry than boron trifluoride. The geometry comes from, I need to accommodate four different sets of electrons around the central phosphorus. Whereas with the boron trifluoride, I only have to accommodate three different sets of electrons around that central boron. Electrons are negatively charged. I want to find the best arrangement in space that keeps those negative charges as far apart as possible. Hence, the different geometries that we see for boron trifluoride compared to phosphorus trifluoride. So in looking at this, we have to figure out the difference between electron pairs. And we can see that right here with the structure of ammonia. I'm going to have two different types of electron pairs. I'm going to have bonding pairs, right? Bonding pairs are shared. Between two atoms. Right, whereas my non-bonding or lone pair electrons, they are only assigned to one atom. In a molecule, they are not shared. So we have to figure out how to best accommodate the non-bonding and bonding pair of electrons assigned to that central atom. And that's where our geometry is going to come from. We have to fit all of these negatively charged electrons that are assigned based on the valence electrons we know are, exist for that atom. We want to fit them the best way possible around that central atom. 
And so for that, we're going to determine what are the electron domains for the molecule. And an electron domain are basically a region of space where we have electrons. So electron domains, for example, a lone pair is a domain. A single bond is a domain. A region in space where electrons are assigned. So a lone pair of electrons, that counts as a domain. A single bond, a double bond, a triple bond, they're defining one region in space. And so even though there are two bonds and a double bond, it should count as one domain because it's defining one region in space. So how many electron domains do I have around this central atom A in this molecule here? Well, we're going to have four different domains because I've got one domain here, a single bond here. I've got my second domain here as a double bond. I have my third domain here. And last but not least, I have a lone pair of electrons. I have four domains, four electron domains around the central atom A. Right, the hardest one maybe being that double bond, even though there are two bonds in the double bond, it counts as one domain because this is one region in space. And so what we're gonna do to determine what is the geometry of these molecules is we're gonna apply this valence shell electron pair repulsion model. And again, this is just a model that we develop that helps us understand the geometry that we observe, the geometry that we know exists, by thinking of electrons as negatively charged particles, which they are, that want to be as far apart as possible. And so this valence shell electron pair repulsion model, that's all it does, is it looks at these electrons and says, I want to place these electrons that are assigned to the central atom as far apart as possible in space. That's gonna give me the lowest energy arrangement of this molecule. And then based on that, I'm gonna have the geometry of the molecule. And so this valence shell electron pair repulsion model supports the geometry that we observe. This geometry of a molecule is established by the number of electron pairs around a central atom. And the best placement for those electrons. All right, we want those electrons to be farthest away as possible and yet still attached to that central atom. And so we've got a few rules to work through when figuring out what is the valence shell electron pair repulsion model, what's the geometry based on that for a molecule. And the first step, and this is why it goes nicely with chapter eight, the first step, draw the Lewis structure. After we draw the Lewis structure, determine how many electron regions are around the central atom, right? How many domains do we have? Then we're going to work through a few of these, but we want to arrange those electron domains as we're going to work through in the table in a little bit, the different geometries presented based on how many domains are there. And so let's just take a look at what that looks like, right? We can think of this valence shell electron pair repulsion theory uh, the same way you'd think of how you would tie balloons together. We can think of these electron clouds as balloons. So if I had to tie two balloons together, if I had two electron domains and I tied those balloons together, the farthest apart in space I could be would be 180 degrees, and that'd be my linear geometry. So I'm gonna do my Lewis structure, I'm gonna count how many electron domains, and then based on that, I'm gonna put it into one of these five categories. So if I have two domains, right, it's gonna be linear. If I have three domains, and so that's the example of the boron trifluoride we saw earlier, where trigonal planar 
because if you have three balloons tied together, the arrangement, the best arrangement in space that puts those balloons as far apart as possible would be 120 degrees apart or surrounded by that central atom. So that's our trigonal planar geometry. Uh, if you had four electron domains, it's tetrahedral, where now we're kind of shaped like a pyramid and all of our bonds are 109.5 degrees apart. The next one, five electron domains, were trigonal bipyramidal, and then octahedral has six electron domains, um, and each of those are 90 degrees apart. Uh, the octahedral, you may think something to do with eight, right? There are only six domains in an octahedral geometry, the octa referring to their eight faces in that geometric arrangement. So we're going to draw the Lewis structure. We're going to figure out how many electron domains. And then once we figure out how many electron domains we have, we're going to try to fit it, fit it into one of these geometries. And then the last step we can figure out based on what is the electron domain geometry that we saw on the previous slide? What is the molecular geometry? And that's going to depend on how many electrons of the assigned electrons are bonding and non-bonding. And so in the next module, we're going to work through this table here and look through, number one, the electron domain geometry that we just kind of introduced, and then number two, based on that electron domain geometry, what is the molecular geometry of that molecule?